morning. Good morning. Um, we are very um, excited that we have uh, some folks from the SCAN Foundation from California. We've got Gretchen um, and Megan. Um, Vice, uh, Gretchen is Vice President of Policy and Communications um, of the SCAN Foundation, and Megan Burke is the Policy Analyst. And those of you who know me realize that you can't, I, I can't say this with, I can't not say this, which is, they're both MSWs, although um, <laughs> Gretchen has a PhD. <laughs> um, I'm recruiting everybody um, <laughs> um, into this. Um, but um, spearheaded by members of the um, committee as well as um, people in the community for years, trying to um, really identify and have a focus on um, aging um, and on healthy aging in Vermont. Uh, and having us be prepared for the changing demographics and to both celebrate the fact that we are the second oldest state in the um, nation and to make sure that we are tapping into both the challenges and the benefits that that brings. Um, and what, um, thanks to um, President Pro Tem Tim Ash along with Senator Kitchell, they, um, we're connected to the folks at SCAN based on a presentation somewhere. Um, and the Senate, and the Senate, with all due respect to Senator Lyons, deemed to talk to the House and say there are these people who you need to um, connect with. And so we have, and um, they have a presentation, and they also um, um, got a copy um, of the bill that um, two House members, um, Teresa Wood, and um, uh, Dan Noyes um, created. Um, so with that, I want to invite the two of you to come up. And, and, oh, and I, I just, and, yeah, please. Yeah. So um, you know, Gretchen and Megan, thank you for coming. As I said, it's great to be, have the face with the voices on the telephone. And as we talked about the uh, plan for <coughs> aging in the state, um, I, we had already communicated with House and Senate actually do communicate on a regular basis. <laughs> and it seemed more appropriate that you folks get to know the House first before the Senate. So we're really happy that you're here. And thank you for the work that you've done and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Wonderful. Can you all hear me OK? Yes. 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 Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, it is a sincere honor to be here in the great state of Vermont uh, to speak to you about some of the work that we've been doing in California on a master plan for aging to share our thoughts um, in regards to all the amazing work that has been done and has been done here in the great state of Vermont um, and to offer some considerations for your reflection. I'd like to thank Chair Pugh and Chair Lyons um, for the opportunity to be here to speak to both committees. For, uh, it's a great honor to speak to one. It's even more so to have both of the committees here and the members of the committees, all the staff um, that support the committees. Um, great thank you for all of that. Um, as well as administrative leaders who are in the room with us today and many stakeholders who are here to uh, be part of this discussion. Um, we do see this as a really important discussion um, it, across the nation um, as we're seeing that changing demographic of uh, Americans growing older um, and Americans living longer, uh, family caregivers being part of the mix across all ages. And this is not just a, a baby boomer phenomenon, it is a transformation that is happening from this generation, uh, the generations that are alive today and all future generations to come. So um, we see this as really a spearheading a movement um, and uh, instead of just simply a moment, um, it really is uh, a longer trajectory. And so uh, the presentation that we will share with you today is to give you a, a little bit of a reflection um, of what we call a master plan for aging uh, at the SCAN Foundation um, and what that means, what the lens in which we are thinking about that concept, um, and then again share some thoughts and um, activities that we're doing in California and then uh, pivot immediately to uh, what we see in Vermont and the ask that was made of the SCAN Foundation. 
Um, the SCAN Foundation is a nonprofit public charity in Long Beach, California, so we're a long way from home, but um, frankly, we both spent time in the Midwest, so we're really enjoying the snow. Uh, so thank you <laughs> for the decoration. Uh, and uh, it is beautiful. Uh, and so, uh, and we, uh, we were created a, as a one-time gift from the SCAN Health Plan that felt it was very important for uh, the, the nation, as well as California, to have uh, conversations about how do we transform care for older people so they can live well in the place that they call home, regardless of age, health, or ability. And so um, you can see more about us on our website and our origins and the kinds of work that we do, uh, but we are a nonprofit public charity. And the work that we share with you today um, was um, from our own charitable purposes. There was no payment made for the uh, insights and the uh, analysis that we made, so I just want to be super clear about that. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit later through the slides about how, how did we come to be um, in front of uh, Senate President uh, Tim, Pro Tem Tim Ash. So uh, moving on to the next slide. So if you take away nothing from today, I would really love for you to take away these three points. Uh, and the first point is that when we look across states, and I'll share some work that we do um, with the AARP and the Commonwealth Fund out of New York, where we look across states and how well they are providing and serving um, their aging populations through long-term services and support systems, what we found is that those leading states that have the best kind of systems of care in total have some form of a master plan that they have thought about aging in a much more comprehensive framework than simply thinking about the Older Americans Act money or thinking about Medicaid or thinking about what is often called frail elders. These are states that have taken a big step back and looked at all across their systems of care and how can they connect different parts of their government agencies, the regulatory frameworks, um, and, and lead the way by saying aging is bigger than, than one particular program. Uh, and number two point is that from our analysis, um, and we are very humble in our analysis, I'll share with you um, that uh, we really looked at through uh, the, what we could find on the internet because ultimately that's what consumers will do. That's what the private sector who doesn't know any of you and don't know any of the administration officials, that's what they'll do. That's what philanthropy does, is they look and see, what are you saying about your aging state, your aging priorities, your vision, your goals? And as we did that look, that very humble look, Vermont has many, many, many pieces to build upon to create a master plan for aging. Um, and third, Vermont is already a pace setter and can continue to lead the way. And on the bottom part of that slide is this nice little perfect purple graphic. Um, and it is perfect uh, for Vermont that as we looked uh, through this work called the scorecard, which I'll speak to in a moment, um, we gave Vermont a prize for being a pace setter in affordability and access for older people here in the state um, in 2017. So uh, there's more on that we can share with you, uh, but Vermont is already pace setting and leading the way. So let's move on. So I keep talking about this scorecard, um, and uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit about that. The Long-Term Services and Support Scorecard was built uh, by the AARP Public Policy Institute out of Washington, D.C., with funding from the SCAN Foundation and the Commonwealth Fund. And our first scorecard was built and released in 2011. And it had five dimensions of care, uh, five dimensions of services, focusing on how do we think about quality across a total system of care, ranking states, this is a state scorecard, ranking states and the District of Columbia on how well are they meeting domains like affordability and access, choice of care and setting, quality of life and quality of care, support for family caregivers, and effective transitions of care. And what you see here is the front page of the three scorecards that are out so far, 2011, 2014, 2017. That leads to the next scorecard comes out in 2020. So it'll be released on June 25th. You'll get to see where Vermont is uh, in that lineup. Uh, as of the 2017 scorecard, Vermont uh, was ranked third overall, uh, which is very impressive. Um, and had uh, a solid scores across all the different dimensions of care that I just spoke about, um, which ultimately led us to give Vermont a Pace Center Prize Award, where that was the Scan Foundation looking at states kind of across multiple scorecards to say how well 
uh, is our particular state's doing, and, and you all went for affordability and access, so you should feel really good about that. When we looked at, the, at those states, we took that step back to say, what really is a difference maker in a state that over time, across all the dimensions, seems to be ranking higher. Those folks that are in that top quartile of states time and time again, and those were states that generally had a master plan of some form. They may have not called it that, but it, there's the documentation there is a focal point of saying, we're, we as a state are thinking beyond um, the particular lines of dollars that are, are traditional in aging services. So I'd like to share a little bit about why a master plan for aging. Why, why go through the work of putting this kind of, of visibility project together, uh, this, this vision setting, um, and with goals and strategies and an orientation towards uh, an accountability framework that looks beyond budget cycles, beyond individual legislative or gubernatorial cycles but ultimately kind of takes a step back and says, where do we want to be as a state in 10 years, in 20 years, whatever the time frame is that a state would like to choose in that frame set. And first of all, it's about bringing visibility to population aging priorities across all sectors, across not just inside of what is traditionally uh, a Department of Aging, uh, the department, say the Department of Aging and Independent Living that's here in Vermont, um, or the California Department of Aging that we think about in our state, uh, but it looks at what is the visibility of aging inside of housing, inside of transportation, inside of the business sector, inside of consumer affairs, inside of energy, inside of the treasury, um, all the different aspects of government. Because we can look at every single agency department through an aging lens about what does it mean for an aging population and the work that those entities do. And a master plan for aging has the potential to do that. It interconnects goals and outcome measures uh, across various strategy and reporting documents. Um, and we'll share with you what we found in Vermont um, about the, there are so many different elements that are the, uh, we, are the ingredients for creating a master plan. Um, but they live in different places they, in, inside of your architecture at the state. They live at different levels. There are people who know them very intimately. And then there's all the rest of the folks who may not even know that. Uh, that Vermont is measuring these important outcomes for their aging population. So it's about bringing all that great work up to a visible surface so that any individual inside of Vermont can easily see what are we shooting for in the state for our aging population to live and age well here in the place that folks call home. A master plan can provide a roadmap for the legislature and administration, um, as well as all the staff, uh, to think about what are both planning priorities, incorporating budget priorities, incorporating oversight priorities. And that it can transcend the legislative timetable that um, for members' um, time in your seats, um, as well as governor changes, as well as, frankly, good and bad times inside of a budget. It's about kind of keeping your eye on the prize of what do you want for aging well and living well here in Vermont, um, whether times are flush or that times are tight. And finally, what a master plan can do is call for the engagement of public, private, <laughs> and what we think of as philanthropic leaders in your community to collectively engage in aging priorities and that we're all working towards the same goals, objectives, and strategies. So this is not about setting a plan for only government to be involved in executing on that plan. But you all and, and all the folks who work with you inside of government here are leaders. You're setting a framework for what is best for Vermont because you were elected into those positions to do that. And so, but this, by that collective energy, can say, what is our North Star for aging and living well in the state? And, and that's something that everybody can get on board with and move forward. So as we took a broad scale review a couple of years ago, when we kind of had that discovery of, wow, states that do better have some kind of master plan. I wonder what's behind that? What's, what are some of the ingredients to get to creating a master plan for aging? That we saw five critical elements to get to the success of a plan. 
part of the reason, part of the, the reason, is, since we focus a lot on California, um, to call these different elements out is that we were really excited at that time to get California to do a master plan. Um, and so we wanted to say to folks inside the, the governor's office, inside the legislature, inside the stakeholder community, here's what we need. Here are the big key elements to get to a master plan. Decisive leadership that comes from all levels of government and what we felt in California we needed was engagement from the governor because we'd had a lot of legislative activity over many years. Um, that, that there is a kind of a rational set of priorities inside of a plan that are also data driven. So, you know, we don't always have all the data that we want and need to measure what, where we are today or where the outcome measures can be for tomorrow. But if we start from a place of looking at what, are the, what is the information about health, human services, about financing, about housing, about transportation, where we're putting our priorities. If we start there and then set some achievable goals in a 10-year time frame, that helps us know are we kind of hitting the mark or not. <coughs> Comprehensiveness, really critical. This is not about focusing only on health and human services. This is about looking far outside of that realm, inclusive of that realm, but far outside of that realm to consider things that we've talked about a bit earlier, transportation, housing, business sector, consumer affairs, um, regulatory bodies, and the like. Stakeholder involvement is critical. Lots of voices around the table, and, um, and the, the the critical element of incorporating those new voices around the table. People who don't think that aging is their business. And what we say at the SCAMP Foundation is aging is everybody's business, including the business of business. Uh, that to, to be focused on what is it that the aging population is, is needing and interested in, and what does that bring to the table from a stakeholder perspective. I think probably before I even go on to accountability, something that's critical to consider is that this isn't a master plan for older people. This is a master plan for aging that includes all of us, wherever we are on the aging trajectory. And then within that, accountability. So that even though the vision may be big and broad, even though the goals are audacious, that there's a sense of timeline and accountability and what are we seeking towards um, at, to at, achieve the comprehensiveness through those rational priorities. And that there's a sense of clarity and, and vision on what those measurable outcomes can be. So a little bit about the California universe. There have been calls for change in California to have to, to address the fragmented system of care for vulnerable older people and aging well across the healthy sectors of the aging population since, gosh, probably the early 70s um, in, in our state. Uh, we, uh, some of you may be familiar with the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly or called PACE program um, that was built uh, out of a pilot project in San Francisco and that's in the early 70s and that was one of the first calls for bringing all the care delivery services together for a very particular population. And from that movement, it continued to spark this conversation of that aging isn't just one thing, that aging has touched many, many different sectors of public life. And so when we say a call for change, um, California has been from calling for that change in many ways, but change is difficult because it's change, you know, change, but as from my vantage point, right, change for you is great, but if I have to be involved in that change, it can be really tough. And so the master plan for aging says we're all involved in that change and let's set the vision of where we want to go. So we had had, as I shared, we had had a, a, a number of different legislators over the time um, the Legislative Analyst Office, many different commissions call for what can we do to break down the fragmentation of care um, and those individual silos in the spirit of, of aging services. And, and frankly, it hadn't gone um, beyond those reports that kind of sat on the shelf. And we felt really strongly that we needed to have both partnership with the legislature and the governor to call forth this concept of a master plan for aging. And in 2018, we had a great opportunity uh, in the sense that we had a gubernatorial race that uh, was not having an incumbent in it, uh, which was uh, you know, a great opportunity to say, let's put aging on the map. Let's put it as a priority during the governor's race. And so the SCAN Foundation, along with another philanthropy down in San Diego called West Health, we created a, a platform called We Stand With Seniors and um, funded a whole body of polling work to speak about where is the, uh, the general California population's interest on aging issues. The polling firm needed to do the analysis 
three or four times because he could not believe the high numbers of people responding over and over and over again in every question about how much they wanted California to have a plan on aging, how relevant aging was to their own families' lives, how this touched them in a very personal way, and they wanted to see California's leadership take this, take this on. We did the poll also two different times and continued to see across racial ethnic groups, across age groups, across party status, across rural and urban, this high 70s and 80% of folks saying, we want to have a master plan for aging. So when you have those kind of polling numbers in an election year, governor candidates listen. And we were very excited to have both the Republican and the Democratic candidate at that time call for a master plan for aging, which was very exciting, something that had never happened in the state. There had never been a discussion at that particular political level about what does aging mean for our state. Uh, we were able to catalyze that uh, by having Governor Newsom, who came in to continue to speak to those issues. But in the meantime, the legislature was very active because they were seeing this trend of a gubernatorial candidate, something they had never done, speak about aging issues. And they frankly wanted to get ahead of the curve. And, and uh, a little bit healthy competition, I think, between the uh, executive branch and the legislative branch in California. And so what we saw was a, a number of legislators put forth master plan for aging legislation in very early in the year. Um, this listing of five on the screen uh, gives you a sense of um, just some of the engagement and interest, but with tremendous amount of sign on in each of these bills. The, and just to give you a sense of it, the first bill by Senator Hannabeth Jackson was about the parameters of creating a master plan for aging, so kind of setting up a legislative architecture, which we would be happy to share that information with you if it would be helpful about what it is that was called for as the elements and domains of a master plan. The remaining bills, um, the remaining four bills were speaking to uh, what are the elements they wanted to make sure were in a master plan for aging. So make sure that consideration of affordable and accessible housing is part. Make sure that there was a, a state level reorganization, something that had been called for in California for years about creating a Department of Community Living um, as, as inside of our state to pull together different state offices um, in ways to really catalyze this concept of community living as people grow older. Um, statewide implementation of a universal assessment so that when we assess people for various public programs that we're using a core set of indicators and measurement tools uh, inside that so that we have a better sense of who are those folks inside of California who have need for publicly funded services, um, and, as well as workforce and family caregiver support issues to make sure that all of those are components inside of a master plan. In addition, um, Governor Newsom continued to uh, stay true to his promise to call for a master plan for aging after he was elected. And in his very first state of the state, which as I was looking at the date yesterday, I was like, oh my gosh, that was a year ago. Um, on February 12th, 2019, uh, he called to very, um, very loud and very credibly for it that it's time for California to have a master plan on aging in the state, which was truly exciting for us to see that level of leadership. Um, that was catalyzed even further in June when he put forth an executive order. Um, again, I think a little bit of healthy competition in some ways between the legislature and the executive branch um, that he didn't want um, to be completely, I think, usurped by the legislative branch and instead worked with them and created much from all of the bills that were put forth to say, let's put a master plan on aging for the table um, in California and, and continues to have legislative support and engagement through that process, which is very exciting to see the two branches of government working so actively together. Um, that executive order called forth that California um, would have a plan by October 2020 and um, with, let's move to the next slide, with multiple elements of that plan. Um, first of all, I think the most critical element that was called for in legislation and that was catalyzed inside the executive order is that the plan will ultimately be developed and truly owned by a cabinet level work group. Um, that the state owns this 
aspect of a, of a plan for aging and that their spirit of their work is engaging stakeholder input in that, but that this is California's master plan for aging, as opposed to what had been done historically is calls for different reports that were buried in many ways inside of stakeholder processes, but not truly owned by the state itself um, and led forth both from all different parties. That cabinet level work group involves every single agency, and, and that's the highest level in California. Every single agency has a seat at that table, which is beyond exciting for us to see um, all the different entities who have ownership over government processes be involved in that cabinet level work group. It is advised strongly by a robust and comprehensive stakeholder advisory committee uh, that has a, about 30 members on that committee from, uh, from folks outside of government to give advisement on all the various aspects um, of that kind of a plan that helped create goals and outcomes. Um, and, and in your packet uh, on the website is a one pager about what are California's goals for a master plan for aging. And we put that forth there from, for you to take a look at kind of how the state is framing um, that vision. There are two very particular subcommittees that were called forth um, in the executive order that came directly from um, comments inside of the legislation. One was to have a subcommittee with a particular eye on long-term services and supports. Um, recognizing the critical role that the state has in funding Medicaid-related programs um, and the touch points to uh, both the home and community-based side of services as well as inside the nursing home industry. And they wanted to have a um, particular vantage point of, of views uh, around the whole range of long-term services and supports and what should, be, what should we be thinking about as part of a master plan for aging on this end. However, the master plan is way bigger than just long-term services and supports, and you'll see that inside um, of the goals that is on the sheet on the website. Lastly, they, um, sorry, that's okay. Lastly, uh, the executive order called forth a research subcommittee recognizing that we probably don't have all the data that we want inside of California to see how well we're doing on a master plan, as well as um, we need to have some measurables that were part of the executive order um, to think about how, how do we start to learn how well we're doing as a state in order to move forward over a 10-year window. And so the research subcommittee, which I sit on um, along with um, many of my university colleagues uh, across the state, that uh, the, the conversation there is to help create that early dashboard um, about how do we track progress on meeting the goals of um, aging well and living well in California. Um, something, frankly, you all are very much ahead of us on and we'll get to see in a moment. <laughs> Um, and so that gives a little bit of a window just in terms of um, some of the pieces that California is working on. Um, one of the other pieces inside of your packet that's on the website is an analysis of other states who already have a master plan for aging, including Colorado, Washington, Minnesota, uh, and Connecticut. Um, and looking at those pieces so that you can see how do other states conceptualize this concept of a master plan. We also recently learned that Massachusetts has moved forward on this kind of a concept as well, and um, they have a robust website which we'll send to you um, and your staff so you can have that as part of your background. Um, so at this point, we'd love to turn to um, our analysis of the state of Vermont to give you a little window into what, using this lens, using this perspective, what we see is already here um, in, in the foray in Vermont, uh, many of the pieces and building blocks for a master plan, and, uh, and then how that might be converted into something further. And so just to give you a window into the consultation review, I had the great pleasure of meeting President Pro Tem Tim Ash at a meeting in, I think it was, it was either Miami or New Orleans. There's a group called the Reforming States Group that is funded by the Millbank Memorial Fund that has three meetings in the fall. And I went and presented on a master plan to all three of those meetings. And uh, President Pro Tem Ash came up to me afterwards and he said, I think we might have one of these master plans on aging. And I said, well, that would be great. I'd love to see it. <laughs> and, uh, and so he said, would you be willing to look, because I offered to the whole group, if anybody would like us to look at what their state's doing. He said, would you be willing to look at what we have 
in the state of Vermont. And I said, we'd be delighted to look and see what you have in the state of Vermont and learn from you and, um, and to see you know, how close do you fit the criteria that we have for our master plan. Um, and, and again, this, uh, no charge for this. This was our, um, our own consultation and great learning experience um, as a foundation. And so we looked at what he sent, which was the state plan on aging, um, as well as we found many, many state reports and other pieces of legislation that you, know, you all have moved on very judiciously uh, for over time. And our findings uh, ultimately are that you've developed many strategy and framing documents that have key ingredients that could be woven into a master plan for aging. So at this time, um, uh, colleague and uh, policy analyst at the SCAN Foundation, Megan Burke, is going to walk through what the pieces are that we found. And, um, and I would again just remind you that this is uh, our very <laughs> humble review of your documents from your website. Um, we did not speak to any administrative officials. We didn't speak to, frankly, any of you um, and your colleagues. And we did that with a very particular intention of that we took that consumer's view. Uh, meaning that they're just going to go to the website and see what they see and we wanted to share with you that vantage point um, and so you all may see you know much deeper than what we have um, and I we are delighted and honored that and look forward to learning from you but this is what we see and Megan take it away thank you Gretchen um, <clears throat> excuse me I have a little bit of a cold um, all right so uh, this slide is a list of the different resources, the documents that I reviewed and the analysis. I'm not going to go through the list in detail right here. Um, the following slides kind of um, highlight different aspects of the different reports. Uh, but wanted to have a nice solid list of the resources. Uh, so we started with the state plan on aging, because that's what uh, was asked of us. And uh, the state plan on aging is uh, uh, a report or this measurable framework that every state has to do um, and it's related predominantly to the Older American Act funded programs um, and what I really uh, appreciated when I was looking through it is actually how person oriented uh, the language was um, and, and how person oriented the goals are it's definitely data driven um, and it was a really great resource uh, for pointing me in the direction towards all these other documents, all these rich documents. Um, but it's, it's really primarily focused on that one funding source, right? Um, so it, the next thing I looked at was uh, Dale's scorecard, as you can see here. And uh, that was just super exciting to see. I just was like, oh my gosh, there's data and it's visible and it's easy to understand and holy cow. Um, and uh, again, a very person-oriented outcomes and program measures. Um, I did notice it's primarily focused on health and long-term services and supports. Um, what was great is that it combined the um, outcomes from the state plan on aging incorporated with other priorities um, from Dale into one single reporting format. Um, there's the accountability there. And, and one of the things I thought about when I was looking at it is, you know, I wonder what the level of stakeholder engagement was. Like, who, who came up, who decided on these outcomes? Did we, did we talk to the people and, and they were like, here's something that's really important for us to measure. That wasn't clear. Um, the Dale mission statement was right there, smack in the state plan um, for aging, and um, person oriented, um, loving the principles that are put forth. That is really a core that you all can you build your programs around. Um, you know, respect, independence, choice. Um, there's obviously a value system here that is, is guiding the work that you all do. Uh, we looked at Act 186, the Outcomes Bill, as that established, I believe, the outcome measures or the requirement for like the Dale scorecard. Um, and uh, what's great about that is the accountability piece in there, right? It requires that annual report. I think a lot of times, um, especially in California, when we would look at you know those calls for change and and groups that would come together with really great recommendations um, and these reports. The piece that was missing was that reporting out, that accountability, that how do we get this moving? Everybody has a lot of great ideas, but how do we make it actionable? Um, and in the, um, in the bill itself, there was one language for one specific outcome that addressed older adults, and um, 
basically Vermonters or Vermont's elders, people with disabilities, and people with mental conditions live with dignity and independence in settings they prefer. It was great to see older adults called out in a piece of legislation as a target population. So then there was, you know, I, I had seen the Dale scorecards, saw the reference to the legislation. I'm like, ah, oh, there's some broader <laughs> outcomes report um, for the whole state. And um, it does incorporate um, aspects of the Dale scorecard. Again, it's person oriented. I noticed that of the, on the website of the 10 outcomes that are listed, two of those outcomes do have aging specific measures. So it was nice to see aging it starting to make its way in. Um, Again, stakeholder engagement, a little unclear. And then there was Act 172 that got the Older Vermonters <laughs> Act Working Group going. Um, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with that. <laughs> right. um, and when I did this initial analysis, the work group hadn't um, submitted its report yet. So I was just kind of working off of some of the framework that was on the website and really appreciated seeing um, how comprehensive uh, the work group was thinking as far as um, all those different aspects of daily life and how our needs kind of interact together. So financial security, health and wellness, right? Social connection and engagement. I think we often um, focus on health and long-term services and supports and there's a lot more to each of us than our health um, and things that we want to do with our lives. <coughs> Uh, so then there was the working group, um, and uh, it was great to see the broad stakeholder representation in that working group. Um, you know, all the way from the state staff to older adults themselves and caregivers. Um, and um, <clears throat> the recommendations, I got a chance to kind of go through them a little bit. <laughs> um, and seeing, again, that. Um, I, I found it interesting. I love that the recommendations addressed what was required in the law and then had all those extra recommendations that were said, but that's, that's not enough. There's all this important work that also needs to be done and um, that they were empowered to include that's fantastic. Um, again, the, the field, the framework of the report is person-oriented. We're looking at the person, not necessarily you know, program specific. Um, we're really trying to think about what's the older adults experience, right, living in Vermont. Um, Great data sources, and again, as I said before, representing that intersection of basic human needs. So, uh, we're here today for age 611. Take a look, and um, it was great to see that the bill incorporates the, the principles from the framework from the working group. Um, they're very thoughtful, um, person oriented, again, really focused on what's the individual's experience. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> we see that the bill outlines, again, Dale's responsibilities, the area agency on agents' responsibilities, um, adding a few more requirements to the state plan on aging, so making it a little bit more than just older American Act dollars. Um, but again, it focused, the, the bill so far is focused predominantly on health and um, community-based services, so is there a broader viewpoint that we can have? Um, also notice it's um, focused on uh, kind of the most vulnerable or um, low-income kind of um, individuals and not uh, the broader older adult population. Um, well, one of the other documents that then as I was, you know, fumbling through the website, uh, came across the state strategic plan. So I'm like, oh, there's another strategic document <laughs> we're thinking. Um, and obviously this came through uh, the governor's executive order. Um, and it was great to see, again, that focus on um, measuring and reporting outcomes on a regular basis, um, that uh, there's accountability to the departments. And, but the thing was, I looked through it, because I really was scouring to see where is aging in all of this. Um, it wasn't really apparent where aging issues fit. Um, or I could figure out where they might fit, but it was not uh, communicated. <laughs> um, and there, were, and, and, and the breakthrough indicators that I could uh, see, there was nothing directly related to aging. And so, as we talk about a population that is um, aging, and um, we know that, well, as Scratch said, we're all aging, 
you know, that should be intertwined in there somehow. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, blatant aging, da 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 da, but there should be something. Um, so I looked at all these documents with these five elements that Gretsch had reviewed in mind, um, and just to kind of see, you know, where those elements fit. And here, we're just going to kind of go through each one. Um, the first element is state leadership. Obviously, you've got a legislature that's engaged. There's several um, pieces of legislation or bills that look at um, aging and really thinking strategically about the future. You have a governor that thinks strategically, and um, from what I can tell on the website, does have um, person-oriented values. Seems like uh, thinking about, again, the Vermonters' experience. So um, there's a value system there. And then with the ad administration, um, seeing the leadership with the principles that have been put forth, how those were incorporated into the uh, state plan on aging, understanding that those really were a foundation probably for the working group, and then they just built upon that. Um, and then just the accountability and the Dale scorecard and the leadership that is shown through that. And what we see is missing um, in the leadership part is really just that, that call for a comprehensive master plan on aging. So like, there's definitely these elements, there's interest. Um, you have these strengths, but how do we take this and just lift it up to the, to the next level? So the second element, priorities are ranked and data-driven, definitely. <laughs> um, you guys are great at that. Um, you use a variety of reliable data sources um, to develop and track your outcomes. And um, it was great, to, the transparency in the sources that I saw. Um, again, love, love the scorecard. I think the first time I went through and just saw like basic reporting out, then the next time I went in, I was like, oh, you can open this up and you can see what the data source was. Oh my, oh, and some of these, there's analysis, you know. Um, and it was, it, you know, oh, I can see how maybe they're working with another department, maybe, here. Um, and so the transparency in that was, um, for me, I guess, a bit of a data geek, it was exciting. Um, <laughs> it, it, but I go back to what's missing again, and it, it's like, you're almost there, but we still say that visible, cohesive platform, right, where all the data and the priorities are easily accessed um, by everyone, the policymakers, your state staff, your researchers, and the public. So they don't have to go through and search everything the way I did or have this interesting little winding path through that it's readily evident and easy to access. Moment three, comprehensive. Um, so many of the priorities um, in the Dale scorecard and the state plan on aging um, touch on different aspects of our lives, right? Uh, obviously the health and LTSS, there's touch points to housing, touch points to employment, I'd like to see where everybody's thinking about um, how do we keep uh, older adults engaged in employment, um, but also how we think about the workforce. Um, so there's, there's all these little touch points. Um, but they still appear to be connected to probably specific funding sources. Um, and it's, yeah, and, and I think um, it could be a little bit, a little bit broader in the thinking. Um, we, when we think about what's missing, we did see um, a lack of connection across state departments beyond Dale. There were some touch points, I think, with, I think I saw with an outcome related to transportation, there might be some work going on with Department of Transportation, but it's uh, it's not it doesn't appear to be kind of an expectation and, and part of um, the culture. I don't know. Uh, population planning, regardless of socioeconomic status, we often focus our attentions on you know what is the state funding. Uh, that's your role. Um, but as Gretch said before, how do we think broader? Um, and then I didn't really see much touching on long-term care financing. Um, one of the caveats here, I, I didn't list the, the working group um, report here. The, the list of recommendations definitely is very comprehensive. Um, but it's not something that's in action yet, and there are recommendations, and there are actionable steps on them yet. So I think there is the right thinking and um, going in the right direction, but didn't really include it in this list yet because it, it still needs to be acted upon. Mm -hmm. um, stakeholder involvement, you know, state plan on aging, there's the stakeholder surveys, focus groups, in-depth interviews that's required in the process. Uh, and then the Older Vermonters Act Working Group, 
again, comprised of a number of stakeholders uh, well represented, um, and I think most importantly, included the individuals themselves, right? Family, uh, caregivers, and older adults themselves. Um, really strong, but what we see missing is taking that stakeholder engagement like to the next step, so it's creating that actionable plan. Um, you've begun to identify issues and, and some solutions, but engaging the stakeholders as you move forward with um, implementing recommendations and prioritizing. And element five, the accountability. Um, state plan on aging, four-year uh, four plan, uh, has its measurable outcomes to report on. And then you've got your scorecard again, and the outcomes report. Um, that are reported annually, have your measurable goals, and like I said before, <laughs> great information, <coughs> making it very transparent. Um, what's missing, again, going back to that, just that visible cohesive platform that reports the outcomes that, that's in Vermonter friendly language. So, you know, myself going, or someone from the public being able to see what, what is the value system, what's important in Vermont. Um, what are those? What are the guiding principles, and and what are we doing, and um, to get there, and how are we measuring that success? Um, so just kind of bringing it all together. I'm gonna send it back over to Greg. <laughs> so just to kind of a, a quick synthesis, obviously lots of strengths uh, across the main elements with leadership, a, a focus on person-oriented values, with lots of data-driven priorities and accountability. Uh, and I think in terms of the opportunities for improvement, which is uh, where we're, we're seeing where the next steps can go from whether it be this body in tandem um, with, with other uh, uh, committees as you see relevant or inside of the executive branches to move forward to that call for this, a, a much more visible cohesive platform where all these pieces are coming together and creates um, a, a visible kind of vision point for aging in the state um, from more of a 10 year window as opposed to, or 10 or more year window as opposed to a four year window um, and setting out those priorities, goals and strategies that all elements from the public and the private sector um, can get behind to move forward um, with a, a very activated stakeholder engagement path uh, to move that forward. And I think that the older Vermonters working group really pushed you over the line of having um, you know, a, a, a great score in our mind um, on that stakeholder engagement process, particularly as we started to go through the recommendation set that was beyond what was called out from the legislation, but really kind of pushing that conversation forward to add so many of the other elements uh, of, of what life, uh, other components of life um, to be added into a plan moving forward. Uh, and so our recommendation is uh, that Vermont craft that highly visible public placing platform that incorporates and communicates a vision, goals, strategies, and outcomes and su to support aging well in Vermont. And it's not just about creating a website, so please don't hear me say that. Uh, but it is about, because it could be easily interpreted as that, but it's the process that gets to that place of saying, who are we as Vermonters who want to age and live well here in this great state? And what is, what is the vision that we are seeking towards and all the elements of, of, kind of what is the movement forward of, of great life here, regardless of age, health, or ability? Um, and that the visible platform of that certainly can be a visible website, um, but it is a document that all can see and all can participate in, in their own unique ways, including the legislature and the executive branch of today and tomorrow and tomorrow beyond that. And so, how do you get started? Um, these are uh, humble recommendations of ways to take the next steps action. I'm sure you may have uh, many other uh, considerations, but we would see that it would be the legislature and or the governor calling for a master plan on aging process and platform. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a really long experience. I think um, in California, our, our governor has basically gave it about 15 months, um, and part of that is, is we've been talking about it for a really long time and needed to have that next steps push uh, from leadership and to get to a place of setting clear priorities and moving forward. 
Um, and so given all of the elements, all of the capacity, all of the knowledge base that you all already have here in the state as shown through all of these documents, um, we actually don't believe it would take a very long time at all. And it is about taking so many of the pieces that can feel a little bit buried down in the administrative architecture from a consumer's point of view and gathering them together and lifting them up. Um, and creating a message architecture around that in using Vermonter friendly language. Um, and you all know how to do that way better than um, us folks on the West Coast. Um, but that people, uh, people want to hear from you in the ways in which you speak about living and aging well here in the great state of Vermont. Um, and there is already that existing person oriented principal platform, the, the goals and principles that are in the Dale State Unit on Aging report um, that, um, that feel a little bit buried right now, but that's an amazing starting point to kind of catapult that vision set and bring it you know, up front and forward, um, as opposed to certainly there are required documents that need to be done uh, for federal funding, but there's so much great content in there that could be the early base plate about what your goals, values, and perspectives are um, to set your vision for what does aging look like here in the state. You have a great opportunity to continue to push forward and expand on the Older Vermonters Working Group and all the other <coughs> stakeholder engagement to help shape around the edges as you bring all of these pieces together to make it something really visible, credible, and polished. Um, and make planning for population, population aging a part of Vermont's culture. Um, my experience of the people I know who um, were born and raised in Vermont is that this is the place where they want to stay. This is the place where they want to live. And, and being visible and, and active in that uh, conversation says uh, that, that folks are heard uh, inside of their elected bodies. Uh, and that, that's infused, uh, an aging lens is infused across all departments. Um, that it's not about that transportation has to only so focus on aging, but that if, if someone goes to them and has a particular need that is kind of from the lens of aging, that they get it. They know what the goals and the priorities and the mission is, and they can speak to that in an effective way. That the housing department can speak to that in an effective way. That consumer affairs or whatever your licensing bodies can speak to what are they doing to promote healthy wellness and aging here in the state of Vermont. So that everybody has that ownership of aging being everybody's business. Um, and that as you pull these pieces together, have a, a clear statement of impact um, on older adults through general population goals. Um, obviously, we thought it was lovely inside of the state strategy document with an acknowledgement of uh, protecting you know, the most vulnerable. It's, it's very easy um, it, from a historical standpoint to think about older adults as part of that most vulnerable group. But as we all know, um, aging has a lot, has a full range of heterogeneity of need in it uh, for folks who have lots of needs to folks who have no daily living needs and are living like all of us here in the room. And so thinking about what is aging well look like across all populations um, can be infused through that general population um, vantage point for the state strategic plan. And so we'll just return to the three points um, that leading states, and we believe Vermont is one of them, uh, has a master plan for aging and we think it's a great opportunity uh, to take the next step in that place because you have so many pieces to build from so far um, and we uh, uh, would love to see you taking your pace setter status uh, as a pace setting state on aging and long-term services and supports and push it even further uh, to a call for a master plan for aging. Uh, inside of the documents um, that you have on the website, in addition to this PowerPoint deck, um, are the goals that California is working on, so you can see that for your consideration, um, as well as a shorter Word document that has effectively a summary of uh, the strengths, challenges, and recommendation to all of you uh, that you can share uh, as you wish with some resources that live underneath that. Um, and with that, uh, the, the presentation part of uh, today's convening uh, is complete, and we welcome any questions or thoughts or dialogue that you have. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak today. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, I think it says something, at least speaking for my committee, that people were listening and paying attention and not interrupting you, which is sort of, <laughs> which is sort of our regular way of, of doing I don't think we've ever done that before. Okay. <laughs> We're deeply honored. <laughs> I, I did warn them. <laughs> um, but so, um, 
I don't know if you want to say anything, and then if they're going to just open it up for questions. Um, I don't know. I just want to say thank you. This is a, this is extremely well done and very thoughtful. Uh, we look forward to receiving the bill from the House so that we can, um, well, well, we always make improvements, right? Which are, whichever way it goes, but. Uh, <laughs> I, can I ask a simple, qu a, a short question? I, I, anyone can ask questions. Oh, good, thank you. Um, so as you were talking about in, uh, increasing stakeholder participation and including in that, uh, going across all the silos of government, um, and, and knowing what the goal is, uh, and, and encouraging the mission statement to be put, fully realized, how do we keep the? How do you? How do you control the? The size of this. I mean, without it becoming behemoth, I can see this just reaching out into every little nook and cranny of both the state and state government. So. Any thoughts on how the stakeholder groups are, can be managed effectively so that we end up with something that is contained, doable? I think that's a great question. Um, and, and different states have done it different ways. Um, I can share with you the current um, process that California is doing. Uh, California chose to very deliberately, inside of what was legislation and then effectively turned into an executive order, to have a stakeholder advisory committee that was the main convening point group, that was a 30 member body that meets on a regular basis at this point in time to give feedback and it represents um, a panoply of perspectives from housing, from long term services and supports, from mental health, from transportation, um, you know, kind of all the way across the board within this 30 member body. And people, you know, we really saw it um, in terms of, you know, where the, the state folks decided to get the, this representation is to make sure that there was depth in the bench of each one of those individuals. So it really is like the 30 big leaders in the state who have worked across many, many different domains and can bring that perspective to bear. Um, then having some subcommittee work across that from the long-term services supports and the research side. Uh, and then the state decided that the best way to garner feedback in an open way, but also in a manageable way, um, was basically to create effectively an inbox. Um, and that having some folks in the team to kind of sift through that and seek themes of the emails coming in. California was a bit more concerned about having a um, breadth of voices as opposed to containment. Um, and also I should acknowledge that um, one of the things that came up through the main stakeholder advisory work group, um, given the extensive diversity that California experiences was to have an equity work group in alongside of that to make sure that we got voices from kind of all of um, the main racial ethnic communities, um, communities um, of, of various types of, of culture, rural, urban, um, tribal communities, uh, in kind of LGBT communities, you name it, um, to have um, voices across the board um, and making sure that those voices were heard through the process as well. So um, while um, I think the question about containment really is um, from the, the the lens of where one sits in the middle of that process, uh, but I think right now we felt like inflow of ideas was really important and being able to sort and acknowledge um, what are the different themes that are coming through with that to then bring it back to the cabinet level work group. Um, Can I add a little bit? Please. Um, so there's the subcommittees for research and long-term services and supports, but not all the goal areas have subcommittees. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that the state uh, decided I would say fairly recently, um, is to do like webinar Wednesdays or whatever. And so they take a different theme and have the experts in that area. So housing was, you know, one Wednesday and it's um hour long. Mm -hmm. Um but that's that's you know put out there, everybody can join, you know, the experts talk and they field uh, questions, and then people can submit comments via um, the website that they have or this email. Um, in response to what that presentation and what now is. And another thing that we did early on uh, with Greater Good Studios mm -hmm. uh, that I found really valuable, uh, as a foundation, we wanted to hear um, 
we really wanted to learn from folks on the ground, like what they value and what's important to them. And so as the state was even trying to decide if we were going to do a master plan on aging, um, we had funded a project um, with greater good students, like just uh, kind of what they're like. They're a, a human-centered design firm that does kind of um, on the ground, almost anthropological research of various communities, kind of across the health and human services sector. And um, we brought them into California in order to hear the aging experience from on the ground in three different communities, and then to host three uh, different design sessions, getting the voices of older adults. Um, and family caregivers to the foray to, again, garner more feedback in that process. So um, I think it doesn't necessarily respond directly right. to your uh, kind well, of containment point, but we thought um, more was better. And what, of course, you know, I think what's <coughs> critical is that the themes are, all, are many of the themes mm -hmm. resonant um, that you all have, have articulated um, in terms of respect and equity and responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and those themes continue to emerge in, in unique and various ways. Thank you. Um, one of the things, uh, so we were meeting about age 611 just before this, and one of the things that we were struggling with was the expansiveness um, that Senator Lyons just spoke about and um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, how narrow or broad age 611 mm -hmm. becomes is, um, <laughs> But uh, I think, um, for me, I think uh, helping to think about sort of a, a master plan concept, um, which I think is something that um, Representative Noyes and I have been thinking more about, not with that language, but mm -hmm. um, uh, is helpful. It's a helpful framework um, for us. And I'm not, I don't know if we'll totally get to it in age 611, mm -hmm. um, but I think the, um, other aspects of state government that impact on um, all of us as we age, like in, in transportation or housing and community development and things like that, mm -hmm. they have aspects of what I heard you say are, are helpful to have in a master plan on aging, but I think exactly what you said, we need to dig them up, elevate them, and have them be present and visible um, through this process of, of a master plan. So. Because um, I know we have a lot of focus on those things in Vermont, maybe not sufficient and maybe not measurable enough, but um, I think that, that would help us to, to elevate those things. And, and we do need to you know, work with the governor's office on messaging. <laughs> um, we, talk, we talk about that all the time. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. And if I may reflect a little bit um, on an experience for me inside California that I've uh, been working in California on these topics for about 30 years now and the master plan call has been this amazing stone soup exercise and if you think about the metaphor of the stone soup um, and communities who feel like I don't have anything to feed um, in, in my family or in my community and somebody puts forth a big pot of boiling water and puts a stone in the middle of it you know, I'm glad I have fellow nodders around that. And, and uh, you know, and, and the carrots and the potatoes and the beef bone and the onion, uh, proverbially, that have come out of this process are things that I've never seen before. There's data that, there are data that were inside at the Department of Finance about aging trajectory and trends that I have never seen before. And my colleagues who've been in this business 10, 15 years longer than I have, have never seen that data before because it sat inside the Department of Finance's office. And it, it was, it's public data, but nobody knew that somebody had really thought about those pieces and analyzed them in that way and they said, Oh yeah, we'd love to present, and we'll you know hand these slides over. And I'm looking at these slides, thinking this is so instructive for us to think about California's aging population, and that has happened over and over and over again, simply by the call for a master plan for aging. The stuff that's inside of the public health department database that has connectivities to transforming systems of care for both healthy and vulnerable older adults. Again, never seen before until the pot of boiling water was put out in the middle of the community square. And it's so it's that value in addition to people working and collaborating in ways that 
frankly, usually uh, butt heads in the stakeholder community, and we are not seeing that at all because they all want to make sure that their value and their perspective is inside the master plan. But this is not about setting up program streams. It's not about setting up service streams. It's about setting up the vision and the goals and the strategies across elements of of public life in its biggest sense about where do we want our state to go and bringing information to bear on that. This is not about creating a budget stream. That's also very, very important uh, for me to communicate um, that in terms of the master plan itself, it will generate budget streams and consideration of service lines and connectivities beyond that or thinking about how do we use the budget that we already have allocated and um, down the road, but it, it in and of itself is not about setting up a budget line or budget stream. So um, just wanted to share that, so thank you. Um, what, what is California, like 50 times the population of Vermont? Um, I can see advantages and disadvantages of being small, being large. Could you just comment on the, the differences in scale? Sure. Have, I think 50 is uh, can probably conservative in terms of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I thank you for that. Uh, it, yes, I mean, you know, we, we lovingly call it the country of California sometimes um, inside of the state, um, let alone the country of Los Angeles, uh, you know, a whole other um, aspect. And so um, I think, you know, in terms of an opportunity that comes out of that, that, that California is willing to set forth a vision about what does aging look like in the state over a 10 year period um, is tremendous. And it's a huge endeavor to say the very least. Um, and so, you know, one thought is as well, if, if California is willing to put this kind of marker down, we would hope that other states would as well. Um, I think there is opportunity uh, in, you know, one opportunity in a smaller state is, um, but similar to California, is, is all the major stakeholder players already know each other. And that can be good and that can be challenging in different ways. Um, I would also say that there are probably many stakeholders who have never thought about this, have never thought about what their work does in an aging context. And I don't know who they are here to call them out, but I can just tell you that kind of the, um, our effective Bureau of Economic Development they didn't really think about aging necessarily. Uh, that that transportation has thought a lot about bullet trains and a lot about really massive scale infrastructure, but that hasn't necessarily thought about how do we bring that to communities um, and and the the aging lens in those communities. And you all have your same issues, um, just like we do in that sense at a different scale. Um, I, I think there probably could be something more challenging in a small state, but in many ways, I think you, you could probably get it done quicker um, because you have A, so much groundwork already done, and B, it's probably about incorporating 10 to 15% of new players who haven't thought about this, and you probably know who those players are in the big macro scheme of things. Or you could get to them as who are the, the top 10 players in, that are the advocates in other committees who never come to your committees and ask them, what do you think about aging in your issue, whatever your issue is? And so, thank you. Thank you. you mentioned the issue of um, data, the importance of data, and I, I feel like one of, the, one of the challenges that we're up against as a smaller state is aging IT infrastructure and the collection of data. And, mm -hmm. You know, just trying to underscore this everywhere we go, that we're as, we're as good as the data we collect. And sure. I just, um, you know, have, has that been a priority in California where you, I mean, obviously you're, you're dealing with a whole different scale, um, but I'm guessing that you're in agreement with that, but I'd just like you to talk more about the data piece. I'm very happy to. Um, uh, in many ways, um, we have incredibly challenging data, IT infrastructure, uh, measurability, uh, information gathering, maybe different ways than Vermont has, but it, it challenging in its own right. Um, we have something called the California Health Interview Survey, and, um, and there is a paucity of aging questions inside of that, and to add aging questions inside of that is very expensive for any given unit. So in many ways, we have something that's really rich of, available to us, yet we don't have any aging lens on that. And so to add the aging lens is complicated and problematic. And that's macro survey data as opposed to something that may be more 
delivery are site specific as well. And so part of the research subcommittee's work is about making recommendations to the state, um, to the cabinet level work group about what do we really need to have and to know in that 10 year window for us to say how well are we doing. Um, and so I think what we feel incredibly encouraged by in terms of taking that widespread macro look at Vermont um, is the work that the team at Dale has done to create the Vermont scorecard so far has been incredibly resourceful of using information that is, you have in the state and information that is coming from outside sources like incorporating the long-term services and support scorecard measure in your scorecard measure, needless to say, as we funded that product, we were really thrilled that you all used it. Like, yay! <laughs> it's being used. Um, but so part of it is making recommendations about if we really want to measure these things, what do we need to do that? But this is also a place of looking at as um, you know, creating a vision about what do you want the information set to be? Because my guess is that there are a number of private sector players in the state through healthcare delivery systems or health plans or other kinds of entities, transportation authorities that already have data systems and could add that one to two meaningful things that would really give you a lens into how well are they addressing the needs of an aging population from their vantage point. Um, so I think this is that space of saying, here's where we want to go. What can everyone bring to the table to make that happen and again so it's not all landed um, here on state government? But you're setting the vision of success. So I actually moved here from California uh, 40 <laughs> years ago. Um, and I moved to a town of 1,000 people. And the thing that surprised, that, that most surprised me was that government was all done by volunteers uh, at, at that level, um, whether it's school board, select board, every, everything. Um, and so what that has meant as a, on a practical level is that we use retirees because they are the people who have the time to do the job right. So that, to me, that puts a really different lens on aging because I see our retirees as a resource mm -hmm. in the state. Very much. Um, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and from that perspective of coming into the state, it would be so awesome to have a master plan for aging that calls that out in the principle set very high up and very visible. Um, because it's, it's that kind of uh, nuance about what you're seeing here that, um, that should be cherished and, and celebrated at a, at a, at a statewide you know, visible level. So thank you. You talked about the, um, you were talking about a master plan. <coughs> and California, it sounds like it, it was um, made possible through ultimately an executive order. Um, and then you referenced Massachusetts is doing that. And now, is that um, emanating from an executive order or is that emanating from a department or agency or from legislation? That's a great example. Well, that was an executive order that, that started that. I just kind of dove into that really just the other day. Okay. Um, but if I remember correctly, I believe it was um, established through an executive order. I think at the end run, we've seen uh, many states move that to that place of an executive order, kind of really pushing it forward and making a call. Um, I would say that from um, in the Colorado instance, in the Connecticut instance, and in the um, Minnesota instance, what we have seen were um, a lot of activity through the legislature to, to bring that visibility and really draw it up from people and stakeholders to get to that place. So I think different places, different entities go through um, kind of different processes. And uh, you all know what would work best here sure. in Vermont, but I think there is a place of that championing leadership um, and you, how that could come through on the legislative side um, would be uh, wonderful and, and amazing. So it, I mean, it's yeah. sort of, it's a both end. I mean, in the sense that if it's, a, if it's an executive order, it only lives as long necessarily as the executive in charge. Um, and if it's 
from the legislature and it's put in the green or white books, um, it exists whether or not the people around this table are here or not. I think that's the most important piece of a master plan, wherever it emanates from, is that it, while different processes can catapult the, pro the development of it, that it ultimately lives in its own and is codified, shall you say, um, in, in whatever way is the most appropriate inside of, uh, of the state government um, to, for it to have life and it to have resonance and, and to be visible and distributed and shared as particularly as each legislative session comes through and any type there is a, there is priority setting for the state in whatever way that it is called out carried forth and visibly um, revisited so it's saying yep we've already we've called out our priorities and here's where they are I want to ask if there's any um, from the legislators any final any question yeah um, thanks for coming in. It's very enlightening. Um, I, uh, I know how much work these people have put in on this thing. And I'm wondering, um, I think we could have a conversation in the committee about this. Mm -hmm. And adding maybe something in this vehicle that we have now, uh, with setting up some kind of an infrastructure to get that done. But I don't think we can get into too much more than that. But it would get it started, and it would be, I love these one-liners, you know, setting up, blah, blah, blah. And then start working on it in the summer and, and uh, go from there. I, I don't think we can jump into the water fully, but I think we get, we've got a vehicle where we could start something like this if the committee mm -hmm. thought it was OK and, because we don't want to lose what we're doing now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Welcome. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, there is this part of me that wants to, um, because you are here, um, if there is someone in the um, audience who would like to ask a question um, to, um, to take full advantage <coughs> before they leave for the plane. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Angela Smith-Jang. I work at Dale. Yes. I work, helped uh, write the State Plan on Aging. And I was curious if any of the states that are, have developed a master plan or are developing a master plan um, use, the, use their State Plan on Aging as the foundation for that and, and, and build it out from there, or if it's a completely separate kind of a deal. Because the you know the older Americans actually plan on aging. Part of the dance we were doing with it was trying to create like a vision, but at the same time recognize we can only um, <coughs> we're funded to do this, and this is what we're we're required to report around, right? So it's that question, and I was curious what other cities have done and how they tried to align these two different plans. Sure, that's a wonderful question. And I think that's how, you know, ultimately how this conversation got started was, uh, you know, was a member of the legislature saying, tell us about the state plan on aging from your perspective. <coughs> I will acknowledge that while I've not read every state's state plan on aging, um, I'm fairly clear that there are, are better and, and not so great plans. Um, and what I mean by not so great is that they meet the letter of the law and um, are the uh, accountability document to the Older Americans Act funds in that way. Uh, and, and yours is not. Yours is a, a really beautifully written document that puts the person very squarely in the center. And it remains true to your funding source. Um, and meeting those objectives that goes well beyond that in terms of expressing values and, and continuity um, to the best of, of what you have to kind of work with within inside of the aspect of your office. And so um, I think there's an amazing opportunity to take the pieces that you have and truly lift them up and out because right now all of that is inside of one department um, and, and we see it as an opportunity to bring it up and move it further. Um, I would say, I don't know the full history of Minnesota, 
but I would, my guess is, if I were to, you know, put a nickel down, it would be that Minnesota recognized that they were doing all this work on their state plan on aging, and it wasn't going as far as that they wanted it to be. And they recognized the need to set forth deeper and longer standing values across things well beyond the funding streams they had control of, and they were able to get buy-in from other departments to say, let's build a plan that's, that's with us but well beyond us. Um, and that we can still address all of our AOA, uh, ACL, uh, Old Americans Act funding requirements in, and so that they did it in that evolutionary spirit. So, um, so kudos, first of all, thanks. Monica. Um, so first, a comment and a question. Um, I, I love that you were calling out the RBA work and the accountability work, primarily because the beauty of RBA is that it recognizes places where you have a direct responsibility and direct accountability, but also recognize there are places where you contribute only to the goal and, and require other contributors and participants. And so I think that that's really the strength of that mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that's something that state government and the legislature has really um, stepped behind and is supportive of. So I, I feel like that's a great vehicle. My question is, when you have been looking at the master plans on aging and the states that are doing those, do they correlate with states that have also sought the age-friendly state designation? So I'd say that there's a little bit crossover, but not a ton of crossover. Um, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Colorado. And then, yeah. And um, Colorado. <coughs> so with the age-friendly designation, right, it, it's, there's the piece of um, we're going to pursue this, a commitment to pursue it versus the implementation, right? And I would say, um, when I was looking through it uh, briefly, like Massachusetts has their plan, but they started a master plan for aging and incorporated that into their, I think, into forming their age friendly. It's like, think how it started, or it might have been a line. It's really a way of because I feel like yes. the stage, the, the designation requires a planning process yes. that I would imagine it would, because that's something that we've been exploring, and so I'm just sitting here thinking, gosh, we met recently with, with ACCB, which is our housing entity, yeah. we met recently with transportation mm -hmm. to make sure that if we were mm -hmm. to pursue this, and they would be on board, and they are very enthusiastic. I think it's this really great kind of housekeeping seal of approval mm -hmm. and that you get to message around that mm -hmm. if you were to receive age-friendly state designation, you get to say that. And then the process by which you are working to get that designation and all the work that you've already done can actually catapult the floor relative to the plan. So it's like there are these aligned and parallel processes that aren't the same, but they feed off of each other and they build that capacity and those relationships in order to get that kind of buy-in. Because I also believe for age-friendly designation, you have to get um, a higher level uh, letter, uh, seal of approval, right? So that's a great way of championing across all of the leadership bodies. We are. Part of it for us is the leveraging, right? Because yes. one of the dilemmas of a state that's the size of one of your is, um, you know, there are three people in our state in the non-aging. Okay. Right. So we, we really are trying to work smarter as well as harder. And that's a, and that's a great um, expression of the opportunities for leveraging, of bringing more people in the boat, not to necessarily do Dale's work, but to say there are bigger outcomes than just what we're moving for that meet the needs of a, a truly age-friendly um, University of Vermont. So, and, and that yes. was Monica Hutt, Commissioner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, that's all right because um, I think because a not everyone may have known who you are, and we are being filmed or on tape so that people yes. know from the span from what you're doing. Um, I saw another hand. Please introduce yourself and for whom you are speaking. Dale Hackett, Consumer Africa. Um, so San Juan Capistrano, um, Dana Point, LA, Pasadena, Lake Elsnore, uh, Big Bear Lake, these are all very diverse areas, very different. 
Um, you've got in San Juan Capistrano, the, um, you've got the mission, you've got the Native American community, you got the Latino tech community. How are you going to work this with such the diversity of culture and then the layout, like you've got the gated communities but then you've got the sprawl of the farms at the same time. You go to Lake Elsnor and you're suddenly rural, 3,500 feet up, you're looking down at the town, like they're coming into land, but you're in a car. Um, and it's a sure clip. It, so Big Bear Lake, you again switch into. I mean, you go. So, so your question is, how do how how how, how are we dealing with how are they dealing with diversity? Yeah. It's a wonderful question, um, and, and a great description of the Southern California landscape upon which I am from. Um, and, and so, uh, what we see, and that is already sparking. So, um, what I'm about to share isn't just Gretchen's dream. Um, it actually is happening in, throughout California. Um, is that the that there's a master plan for aging at the state level that sets forth goals and strategies and objectives and, and measurables and that that sets a template for counties which are very powerful in our state and cities to then do their own master plan for aging relative to the diversity and the experience um, that they bring to bear and so instead of so, because we have many cities who have gone for um, age-friendly city status, and they got to the place where they got the stamp, right? And then, but they didn't have a lot necessarily underneath that to move that forward. So I think you brought a really great point um, earlier um, that connects with this question here: is how that age-friendly um, is is needed, but not necessarily sufficient to transform the landscape for an aging population. But we see that that the master plan has a bigger vision point than that, and um, an executable opportunity within that, that then cities and counties can replicate that planning process for what does it look like on the ground. And we're seeing Ventura doing that at the county level. We're seeing Los Angeles do that at the county level. San Diego's been on a journey for a long time, and they're so excited that the state's setting a frame so that their planning processes actually marry up nicely with what the state Kind of elements are so um, we see it as an umbrella to then states uh, that cities and counties can kind of localize it in their own way so thank you um, and Gretchen and Megan thank you uh, thank you very much for being here this is uh, excellent information that's going to help um, Dale and it's also going to help the House Human Services Committee and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee we, I think we're all very enthusiastic about um, trying to work on the master plan and do what we can to include some of the comments that you've made. It's been really helpful and we really appreciate your being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are here and we're happy to keep you posted on uh, what happens in California and other states. Um, I look forward to seeing where you all take this information. So well, have a wonderful you. day. Thank you for your thank research. You, um, and um, House Human Services, could we be upstairs at 11? And Senate Health and Welfare will be downstairs <laughs> at 11. <laughs> <laughs>